Well, it's always fantastic to be, to, be, to be set up that way because the theory is you can only go one way from there, and that is down. Um, a year ago, almost to the day, um, I gave a, a talk on, on Brexit um, to clients. They, 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 were, they were predominantly fund uh, management clients. Um, a lot of our, our clients that that particular seminar were. Uh, our firm took a stance of neutrality on the question of, of uh, Brexit, uh, unlike many of our peers. Now, the difficulty with taking a stance of neutrality is it means that you actually have to say something. Um, other than simply spout rhetoric, stick to the facts, try and uh, actually explain potential scenarios, legal implications, and the like. Give it a forensic twist, if you will. The point is that the substance of that discussion from literally a year ago to the day has not changed um, in terms of what we know. Of course, uh, there is a reality. It wasn't just, it's no longer been in the realms of fiction as to whether um, a, a lot of what we talked about then um, might happen. But there is still the issue about it um, possibly happening. Now, what I want to do today is to talk about the passport in perspective. There's a lot of talk in the press about passports, about concepts of equivalence, um, and really to unpack these concepts, to explain them, in the hope then that, that we're all better equipped to think about the issues, which are essentially political issues, going forward, but also to understand what is required from the perspective of law and regulation. And having looked at some of those concepts, then to think about the immediate impact on the legal position of the referendum um, result, and also then to think about the, the longer term. Um, to try and do so, I hope, in a way that is original. These issues have been discussed um, a lot in the press, a lot of the law firms, the consultants, um, and it's trying to, to unpack some of those concepts, I say, and, and, and to, to breathe some type of, of, of life into them. Now, the first point to note um, is it's always good to, ha to have a small um, misrepresentation in the title. We talk about the passport in perspective. Actually, there's a need to talk about the passports, because as I'll come on to say, there's not a single passport. However, there are some common features. Now, as a lawyer, we don't like buzzwords. But actually, the use of the term passport is apt. Because the idea of a passport, particularly in the context of the European Union, is that if you are a citizen of one country, you've gone through the process, the hassle, as it were, of securing a passport, then you have a right to enter other EU countries um, without the need to go through that process again. And that really is the essence of the single financial market passports. The practice is simple. If you're a bank, for example, you seek authorization from the Prudential Regulation Authority and the Financial Conduct Authority. And having secured that authorization, which is onerous, you then have the right to offer your services either on a cross-border basis, say via email or, or telephone, um, to individuals in other member states, or to go to another member state and establish a branch accepting that there will then be a measure of regulatory oversight in that, that home member state. But it's important to note that it is a right. In many respects, the position of an inward passporting firm, as they're known, is almost better than that of a domestic firm. They still have to go through a, a, a process in the home state. So the rights and freedoms are just those, essentially a, a freedom of movement, a freedom to do business. Now, the, co the corresponding duty and obligation on the, the member state, I've already touched upon, but that's, upon, that's essentially to ensure that anyone that carries on, carries on those activities um, using your home member state as their home are authorised. 
the directives will prescribe a minimum set of requirements, particularly around organizational requirements, regulatory capital um, being the, the main one of those, but certain other issues around fitness and properness. And then it is accepted that investor protection and conduct of business regulation is shared, but also very much um, the bailiwick of the host member state, the basis being that it is the host member state that is better equipped to protect its own investors. But it's important to understand the, the rights versus obligations, because as one begins to talk about the need to retain the passport, what is thrown up is the need or the understanding that there are certain minimum standards um, that would need to, to be adhered to. And I'll come on to talk a bit about those in due course. Now, as I mentioned, there is not a single passport, but rather a number of passports. In all, there are nine different directives that one might um, talk about as being the single financial market directives. And I would pause there to say that there is not yet a single financial uh, or single market in financial services. The grand design would be to create a, a situation whereby the, the vast majority of the binding legal measures would be those made by the Commission in the form of directly applicable regulation. The guidance would be set by the European supervisory authorities, European Securities and Markets Authority, the European Banking Authority, um, the, the Occupational Pensions and Insurance Authority. And I would suggest, in the fullness of time, and if one looks at the manner in which directives and regulations are being developed, that more and more administrative power would also be transferred to those central authorities, with the result that the likes of the Financial Conduct Authority, although again, depending on the, ma the, the manner in which we, we leave the European Union, would end up being an administrative agency, still charged with enforcing the laws, but with very little say over what those laws actually mean. And one could already see this in practice when the Financial Conduct Authority, uh, in particular, took a step back from issuing definitive guidance on the meaning of regulation, simply saying, we're scared of getting it wrong. We don't have the final say. If you look, for example, at the, uh, the, 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 the second uh, version of MIFID, MIFID II, um, the power that is given to ESMA to license firms, in essence to give them a, a, a third country passport, the power that is given to ESMA to oversee credit rating agencies, for example, to oversee trade repositories, was very much a signal of a centralization of power. An interesting what if, of course, is that if there had been a yes vote in the, uh, um, the, 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 the referendum, and the European Union had accepted former Prime Minister's demands, which essentially was, were designed to put a halt on ever closer union, what impact that would have had on, on, on the European supervisory authorities. That, however, is history. But I think it's an important point that for anyone to say that the single market financial service is complete, it is not. And actually, if you go one step further, the, 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 the two-track, uh, one talks about the two-track Europe, but obviously this, this distinction between the banking union um, and then the rest, as it were, is also a significant one. Although, interestingly, someone suggested last week that perhaps a solution for the United Kingdom would be to join the banking union um, and avoid joining the European uh, Union, but I'm, we, we shall leave that as it may. But just not, not to, to, to canter through the list too much, but it, 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 for banks, one thinks of the capital requirements a directive, um, MIFID, the market in, in, in financial instruments directive, which, which touches so-called investment firms, also has an impact on investment managers, uh, the payment services directive for those issues wanting to offer the service of, of, of cross-border payments. Um, the so-called USITS management uh, company, um, the USITS directive, the alternative investment fund managers directive, and then the two insurance directive, Solvency II, and what is now known as the, the, the insurance distribution directive. It is those nine directives in which you will find very similar language, simply saying that an entity authorized in one member state will have the right uh, to offer services or establish a branch in other member states, subject 
get to a formal process, and it is that it, it, if you, in essence, will notify your, your home state authority that you plan to travel, and they will then notify the, uh, the, the host uh, member state. But that's the essence, that, that really is the essence of, of, of the passports. Um, and an interesting point to note, however, is that, of course, the passports uh, imply a measure of reciprocity, and um, indeed the figures that were published by the Financial Conduct Authority last week suggested there are more entities inwardly passporting than, than, than UK entities using the passport to offer services in, in, into the EU. But it is not necessarily the case that all financial services are regulated in the same way throughout the EU. And I'll take the, the really the, the, the prime example being that of the act of lending. Now, outside of consumer credit or, or mortgage-backed lending, the actual act of extending credit is certainly not regulated in the United Kingdom. If one wants to enter into trade finance or project finance, um, provided you're not using deposits to finance those loans, and it's the point at which it, it, the, the, the regulation under the, the, the CRD comes to the point of the deposits, that will be permitted. That is not, however, the case in, necessarily the case in other EU member states. So here you have an issue, and, and we indeed have advised, um, advised a number of, of banks on the continent who have said, can we, will we still be able to do project finance? To which John says, well, on current arrangements, yes, it shouldn't change your ability to lend from your balance sheet uh, in, for example, the Netherlands into the UK won't change. However, the same could not necessarily be said. And I think it's an important point there because the, the, the suggestion that, that all financial services are, are regulated equally throughout the EU is is, is is, is wrong. The other point also is to consider EU law beyond the passports. Those nine directives are key. But there are other key pieces of European law. The European Market Infrastructure Regulation, which governs the clearing of OTC derivatives and the reporting of OTC derivatives, um, again, is an EU piece of law, um, imposes certain obligations, but also re recognises, for example, um, the ability of, of a UK clearing house um, to clear trades with, a, with, with, with a, an EU bank. Um, similarly, issues uh, around um, the market abuse regulation, although interestingly enough, that has jurisdiction throughout the world. Um, there have been US hedge fund managers that have action taken against them under uh, uh, under the, mar well, it, 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 the market abuse directive as it was, but now the market abuse regulation. But it's important to note that, that EU law doesn't just apply in the context of passports and in the context of, of, of directives and looking at what the interactions would be, how that would be affected. Um, a point to note here is that under the European Market Infrastructure Regulation, the European Commission may recognise um, uh, central clearing uh, party CCPs as being equivalent. It just happened with respect to the, the United States. But I think an important point that we don't just talk about the impact of, of, of EU law. And then the final point to note also is, is the manner in which EU law um, finds its, its, its application in the United Kingdom. Um, I mentioned directives, and again, the, uh, the meaning of a directive is in the word itself. It, it is simply a direction to a member state to make laws to give effect to those, those measures. It is directed at member states. It's not directed at individuals. There is a body of law around the rights which individuals will acquire from those directives, the manner in which they can enforce those rights against member states, even in some circumstances against one another. It is, it is in essence, something that member states are expected to do, a minimum set of standards that they're ex expected to, to, to adhere to. The manner in which the directives find application in, in, the, U, in the United Kingdom, primarily through Acts of Parliament, but also through uh, secondary legislation made by the Treasury, FCA rules. An interesting question that is raised is what happens to all the rules that have been made to give effect to European Union law when the United Kingdom exits the European Union? Do those rules all fall away? To which the answer is no, they do not, because they, they, they are, um, that is UK 
ready-made law. It's been made to give effect to an international obligation, EU obligation, but it should remain. However, the difference is that um, there is freedom then to change the content of those. And I'll come on to, to, to touch on those. Um, I already mentioned the effect of directly applicable regulations. Ironically, given a lot of the discussion around directly applicable regulation, the main point to note there is that a directly applicable regulation removes the power which a member state has to make increased regulation. There's an interesting what if around, um, uh, around the capital requirements regulation, the argument made that actually it hasn't given full effect to the implementation of Basel III, that there may be flexibility now for the, for the United Kingdom to say actually in certain areas we think bank regulatory capital needs more regulation, but then we get more flexibility in other areas with respect to, for example, bankers' bonuses or challenger banks and more proportional representation. Uh, proportional regulation for them. So it's important to say to, to really understand those concepts and, and apologies if a lot of that is, 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 is repetitious. But the danger is that certain concepts get dropped into particularly into political discussion um, without fully understanding them. And the other significance being that if one thinks about how one wants to maintain those rights, what in essence is, is, is required, particularly taking into consideration the rights versus responsibilities. Now turning to the, the, the practical application the immediate impact of the referendum result in law. On the morning of the referendum, the Financial Conduct Authority put out a statement. And that statement, um, in essence, contained four points. The first was that current EU law continues. I've just been giving a talk on the implementation of MIFID II. And so one opens with the point saying, you still have to implement MIFID II. Um, you still have to adhere to it. EU law still applies until we leave the uh, EU. There's an interesting point around the flexibility which the UK government would have now, or between now and uh, the date of exit, to alter the, the, the content of laws. Um, on a strict analysis, the argument would be there should be none that while we're in the EU, um, until the, 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 the mechanism under the treaty um, has run its course, and even if, say, the European Communities Act has been repealed, there's argument that, that European Union law remains. The supremacy of European law as a concept is one that originated um, through the European Court of Justice, upheld by the, the Judicial Committee of the House of Lords and the Supreme Court more recently. Although, interestingly, the Supreme Court did, did, did suggest, and this was a long time before anyone was on Brexit, um, that Parliament may um, could, could override EU law, which is interesting. It was, it was said as an aside, but certainly it did shake up some, some of the theory. Um, the second point is that the powers of the EU authorities remain. I've already mentioned ESMA, European Banking Authority, and, and the like. Um, their, uh, their powers to ensure that the FCA, the PRA, implement uh, EU law um, continues, and indeed the Commission's power over the United Kingdom to take infraction proceedings where um, an EU directive hasn't been implemented properly remains. Passporting remains. I've already talked about passporting, nothing more to say. Forthcoming EU laws are still going to have to be implemented. Now, I've referred to, uh, or so I've come to something called the Mars test. It has nothing to do with Mars bars, but it essentially is that if you haven't heard of Article 50, then you've been on the planet Mars. So I don't want to dwell in too much detail about, about Article 50. Um, but there are a few points uh, to note around that. Um, the first is this idea that Article 50 is very much about the breakup. It's about the extraction of the United Kingdom from the European Union. Union. It does not also deal in and of itself uh, with the agreement for the future relations um, between the EU and the United Kingdom. Um, so the question that that gives rise to is will there be two agreements, the one agreement to deal with extraction, and that is very complex. It's about unwinding um, a lot of the relationships, um, and then do you have a second agreement which then deals with the nature of the relationship, which the, the, the essentially the trade deal which the UK is going to have. The question that also arises is whether the UK has competence to negotiate the 
the trade deal before it exits. And again, while politicians have suggested that is not allowed, there is a legal question mark over that. And then the final point about the need for transitional provisions. Because let us say that the, uh, the negotiation of a trade deal takes a lot longer than the two-year period between the so-called trigger um, and, and, uh, and, and then the exit, um, whether there can be a transitional period to ensure that we don't automatically default to WTO rules. Of course, um, the hidden premise in that is that all the rights that one has are fine to continue, but so will all the obligations, uh, all the obligations continue you as well. Um, in terms of timetables, again, there's a lot been said in the press about that, nothing to say. Now, the question that arises really is about the longer term impact. There has been talk, indeed, for well over a year about the different models of Brexit, and indeed people will throw up five. We would suggest, however, that really there, there are three basic models or, or, or basic sets of legal considerations with a, with a variation on the third. The first and the most negative one is what is described as a, a, a total lockout, um, which is to say that, that um, the United Kingdom is, is not recognized in any way as having equal regulation. Uh, one might say that that would be a very severe set of, um, of, of political conditions that would arise. That said, however, until until shortly before MIFID II was finalised, that was the position that much of Europe was taking with respect to, to third country firms. The theory being that, that a, a wall would be put up and that anybody wanting to offer investment services to a person in the European Union would have to come and set up a, a, a branch here. That was watered down in the final, um, the final version of MIFID II. Um, but certainly that would have been the, 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 lock, the lockout scenario. Um, the third, or rather the second scenario, is that of the so-called third country access. Now again, a lot is said about third country rights, um, and the suggestion has been created that third country rights are somehow universal. Now, when we were talking to our asset management clients, um, happily for them, the two of the three main directives that govern their activities, two of those recognize the concept of third country rights. And the concept is a very, is a very straightforward one. It says that if you're a non-EU firm, you will have certain rights to market your services, um, to provide services, uh, and in, in, um, in, in certain circumstances um, to do so on a, on, on a pan-EU uh, basis. Uh, they are generally restricted only to sophisticated clients, so that is, that is an issue if you, you were dealing with, with, with retail. But the problem is that it creates a false, um, a false illusion because uh, those two directives for asset managers are the only two directives that recognize third country rights, um, third country passporting rights. Of the other nine directives, seven do not recognize the concept. Now, it's a slight misnomer because under the Credit Requirements Directive, for example, there is a mechanism for the Commission to recognize third countries for the purposes of so-called lead supervision. So if you have a United States bank, um, the, the Commission has said the, the lead regulator for that bank may be the, 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 the Fed. Um, it wouldn't have to be a home state regulator. But that, again, is a very limited circumstance. Similarly, uh, there is a mechanism for recognizing the robustness of certain third country banks for the purpose of risk weighting ratios when it comes to the exposure to those banks. But this is not equivalence in the sense of the, the, the passport. That third country access, uh, the rights of access is really limited to fund managers. If you are a hedge fund manager or private equity manager or managing so-called segregated mandates for institutional investors, um, in the longer term, there should be no change to your regulatory burden. You may be subject to dual regulation, say by the German BaFin, if that's your so-called um, member state of reference, but that will still be regulation ultimately under the AIFMD and under a level two regulations and, and, and the like. Very different, however, if you're dealing with retail, and as I say, if you're a bank or an insurer, the concept is not, uh, not recognized uh, at all. So the, the idea of third, part of, of third country access as some type of universal 
universal panacea. It's not one legally, current arrangements would work. If those directives were all amended to recognize third countries, then the UK would be swept in like the United States, um, like other countries. This then leaves um, broadly uh, the, the third approach, and, and there, 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 there are two variations. The first of those is member of the European Economic Area, and I'm not going to say a lot about that, save that EEA member states have all the rights, all the passport rights uh, that EU member states have, and all the corresponding obligations, certainly in the context of financial services. There was some debate, and indeed a minor constitutional law crisis in Norway when it came to implementing the AIFMD over the role of the European supervisory authorities. But a recent amendment uh, to the European Economic Area Agreement has clarified that, and somewhat begrudgingly, in the case of the Norwegians, the jurisdiction of the European supervisory authorities has been recognized. But the key point to note is that there is not a seat at the table when it comes to making those laws. There are regulatory committees, and certainly there is a room for influence, um, but there's, there's not, there's not a, 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 an actual um, a lawmaking power. So this really leaves the, 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 final, um, the final issue to consider, and this is the, 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 the so-called negotiated access route. And it is a route that um, certainly Andrew Tyree, in a, in a very useful paper, um, was hinting at. Uh, there was a Cambridge academic and a, a, um, I think a, 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 a University College of London academic that went before the House of Lords Committee also talking about this. But the essence of this is that the, the United Kingdom would negotiate um, a, a, an arrangement whereby um, financial services could be provided on a cross-border basis. There would be some type of, of branch recognition, essentially having the effects um, that a passport has. I say having the effects because there, there, there are a few um, variations around that. But the basic proposition to bear in mind is the more access to the EU market and financial services um, the United Kingdom requires, the more compliance the EU law will be necessary. But there's a further crinkle on that, and that is that in certain areas, EU law is itself merely an application of international standards. Basel III is a good example. Um, and while, yes, the, uh, the European Commission has been able to diverge, um, well, there isn't much detail in, in Basel III, but implemented in standards, that is still, in essence, the implementation of international standards. Similarly, the rules around clearing. I mentioned the European Market Infrastructure Regulation together um, with the, the, uh, the MIFID II package, the regulations part of that package, they have the same effect as the Dodd-Frank Act, for example, uh, in, the, in the United States. Um, those are international standards, so the idea that one can diverge completely in a general sense is, um, is false. Of course, it doesn't mean that there's not scope to set up something akin to a, a London International Financial Centre, which simply recognises a, 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 a lighter touch regime, say, for wholesale firms not wanting to do business into Europe. Um, and certainly you see examples of that in, in, in the Channel Islands. I also mentioned the concept of equivalence and, and the idea that, a, that a, a equivalence test would need to be developed. Now, equivalence is, is, is important because equivalence doesn't mean equivalent. It doesn't mean the same as, but rather it's equivalence of outcome um, and strength of regulation rather than the form uh, of substance. Um, and it may be that some of the tests under the current directives are the ones that, uh, that, 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 that would, be, would be borrowed. But again, there's, there's a lot of, of negotiation that need to go there. Issues around decision-making. Um, would there be the need, say, for a standing regulatory committee similar to that in the EEA, um, which was essentially a forum for, um, for the United Kingdom to, to feed ideas, as it were, in, into, into the substance of whatever those, those, those arrangements would be? Because one of the criticisms that, that, that's been made of the arrangement of Switzerland is that whenever there is a need to alter it, it has to be renegotiated, so that any individually negotiated solution would almost need to be future-proved, say, building other mechanisms to deal with, um, with, uh, with things on a case-by-case -case basis. The question also whether it would be necessary to have some type of parallel court, a type of, 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 of dispute um, resolution um, body. Now that may be, again, more political in that. Um, it's simply a question of, of uh, those in the EU saying they feel they get a better sense of justice from neutral arbiter. 
it could possibly go against the trend which says that London <coughs> is a well-known um, <coughs> legal centre for, for uh, uh, resolving uh, disputes. But that's one that's got to be, be thrown up. And then the final point really is this question around the wholesale and the retail divide. Um, there'd be a lot more willingness to allow cross-border institutional business. That's already the premise behind the third country passports under the AFMD and MIFID. But the, when it comes to retail uh, in, in investor, a, a broader access of products, um, that there's more reticence on, on, on the part of the officials to allow for that. Well, I trust that's, that's armed you and certainly give, given, given some substance to a lot of, of concepts, I think, that, that, that get thrown about. Um, also to, to give some food for thought to the types of mechanisms that would be necessary um, to have uh, the effect that is currently had. I think the key point to note, and again, it's the point that you're probably all aware of, is that with the rights will become, become the, the responsibilities, and the main responsibilities being to adhere to the substance of um, those bits of, of European law that would be, uh, that, that would be applicable, albeit with some, some room for, for divergence.